All right, friends and neighbors and strangers from distant lands. We've come together today to now talk about Wi-Fi. And today we're going to do part one, the alphabet soup, or at least a gentle intro. And to get started with this new series, I've decided to pick a really obnoxious set of uh, purples to carry us through. To get started, are we talking about 802.11 or Wi-Fi? Well, they're the same thing. Wi-Fi is the nickname that lots of folks use for 802.11. Now, 802.11 is a set of standards that comes from the IEEE, or the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers. And so there's the link. You can go out and take a look at that. Lots of good information out there. But why does everybody say Wi-Fi? Well, Wi-Fi is a, a short version of the phrase wireless fidelity, which some folks use to refer to wireless networks or wireless security. We'll talk later on about wired equivalent privacy. Uh, and for the most part, we say that this term came from the Wi-Fi Alliance. They have a lot of good information out there too, so there's their link. So when we say Wi-Fi or 802.11, we're talking about the same time, uh, same thing, and we are going to be spending almost all of our time with the specifics in the 802.11 set of standards from the IEEE. Now to get us started, uh, let's talk about the OG plain 802.11. Look at me trying to be cool. Um, now 802.11, it's kind of funny to think about this, but it's only been around for about 25 years. And you could argue that it was five to eight years before there was any real adoption. So maybe 2005, somewhere in there. So the original standard, dates from 1997 and was updated or published really in 1999. And on the right hand of the slide, you can see the official title, right? Information Technology, Telecommunications and Information Exchange Between Systems. So part 11, so 802.11, uh, Wireless LAN Medium Access Control and Physical Layer Specifications. Now that says a lot. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a, a little bit. Now the part of the the spectrum or the wireless part of this that we're always talking about is 2.4 gigahertz. Oh, that's 2.4 gigahertz network. Well, what does that really mean? So when somebody says 2.4 gigahertz, what we're really talking about is a range of frequencies from 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz or about 100 megahertz worth of spectrum. But it's really a little bit less than that because we put space in between the channels and everything else. So we're really talking about eh, 83 and a half megahertz of spectrum. This is also called the ISM band. And again, we'll talk about that here in a little, little bit. Now, the early 802.11 standard was just the first shot at this. And so not designed for enterprise, no robustness, no real security uh, per se, uh, no spectrum manager. So there's a lot of things that were missing from this early standard. So it was sort of relegated to Soho or small office, home office environments. Maybe people like me <laughs> and other folks tried to keep uh, pushing a little harder and, and getting it uh, to be in places maybe where it shouldn't have been because it had a pretty low, low capacity. But, you know, we were really, really excited in the early 2000s. Now, the really cool thing about 802.11 was that as a LAN standard, it had just about everything that you needed to operate. It had all the physical layer descriptions, you know, the signaling, the methodologies, all of that. It had all of the stuff at layer two or the data link layer, framing, operation, error checking, addressing, access method, what was an access point supposed to do, what was a node's job, all of those things. And when you recall Ethernet, Ethernet had to do that too. Ethernet had a physical layer component, all the physical layer specifications, Manchester, NRZ, all of that, and then all of its layer two stuff as well. So if you go back and review all the Ethernet videos that I've done on the channel, a lot of times I'll talk about the Ethernet frame. Well, we've got the same thing here. We've got an 802.11 frame, but the operation between those two protocols is quite a bit different. So if you were going to read, if you're going to print out and read the 802.11 standard, it's actually enormous. It's a very, very large document, so it would fill a tome, right? Subsequent standards, such as 802.11b, g, and a, they were mods to the physical layer. So the amount of information in each one of those standards, while really good stuff, 
was nowhere near as large, so it was, you know, a much smaller standard because it didn't have to describe anything that was going on at the, um, the data link layer. So there was almost no changes there. Almost. Now, 802.11n changed that big time. So there were all kinds of updates and modifications to the behavior at layer 2 with 802.11. And of course, today we have 802.11ac, AD, we have additional B standards, AF, and then there's all of the related standards that aren't wireless standards themselves, but we use them, such as 802.11i, which is you know a security standard. So let's talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of 2.4 gigahertz, which is of course where all of this started. So it is this range of frequencies between 2.4 and 2.5. What we might say is that it's not just frequencies, but they're actually channels. And a channel is a chunk of spectrum that we're going to actually use to swap or to send data. Now, 802.11.1999 actually described three wireless standards. Two were RF and one was optical. How crazy is that? So the two optical or the, the two RF standards were frequency hopping spread spectrum and direct sequence spread spectrum fundamentally different technologies. Frequency hopping uses one megahertz channels and so what you do is you do, do this little burp of data and then you hop to another channel. So while you were on a particular channel you use Gaussian frequency shift keying. So when we get to talk about the physical layer in more detail we'll talk about modulation schemes but uh, Frequency hopping spread spectrum does frequency shift keying and then hops to another channel, does another burp of data at frequency shift keying or with frequency shift, shift keying, and then jumps around again. So we actually had something called a hopping sequence. Direct sequence spread spectrum uses five megahertz channels and does, and you're assigned to that channel and you stay right there. And so it used uh, differential phase shift keying. So again, another modulation technique with something called a, a, uh, a chipping code. Now the optical wireless standard was in the infrared band, so 850 to 950 nanometers. So uh, this is not the same thing as you know the IRDA uh, port that we saw on laptops or that we use for other optical things. It was a different, different standard and used pulse position modulation for a little uh, light pulses. Now the 2.4 gigahertz portion of the spectrum is also called the ISM band, but the ISM band is much larger than just 2.4 gigahertz. The three main chunks that we always talk about are the 900 megahertz, you know, 902 to 928, 2.4, and then there's a chunk of spectrum at 5 gigahertz. Now this starts to make sense when we go, oh, okay, um, in the within the industrial or science and medical band, we're using 2.4 for 802.11, B and G and the early standard 802.11 and then we jump up to 5 gigahertz well really it's a chunk of the 5 gigahertz spectrum that's also part of ISM and of course we have cordless phones not cellular phones but cordless phones that use very commonly the 900 megahertz portion or the 2.4 gigahertz portion for their signaling now another part about these these um, bands or these frequencies is that they're unlicensed and so they're governed by the code for federal regulations number 47 part 15 which is why when you look if you open up your battery on your phones or you look at your devices they'll say this device conforms with part 15 well part 15 is for unlicensed devices and it describes the power levels and things like that now the bummer about 802.11 even though it had you know almost everything that we needed to operate was that it was slow, very slow, one to two megabits per second. Now that was enough to get a lot done. Uh, when we were building labs at RIT, we had no network connectivity. So we used early generation 802.11 gear to get patches and updates and everything else done. But it was, it was slow. So along comes 802.11b, and 802.11b says, wouldn't it be kind of cool if we could bump this up a little bit? So the big deal about 802.11b is that it dropped 
the frequency hopping spread spectrum and the infrared spectrum and said, look, we're just going to focus on direct sequence. So you could really argue that direct sequence this is the first place that it really won in 802.11. And it combined channels. That's why we use channels 1, 6, and 11 all the time, because that gives us about a 20 megahertz channel. So channels 1 through 5, 6 through 10, and then 11 on up, that's why we use those. Now with 802.11a and g, the two next steps, we got higher speeds, 54 megabits. Well, how did we get higher speeds? Orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. So that was the next big step. And we'll talk more about that later on. So uh, 802.11g, still in 2.4 to 2.5, but 802.11a moves to 5 gigahertz. And really, again, we're talking about a range of frequencies from 5 to 6, uh, 6 gigahertz. The next big change, and really where we are today, is with 802.11n. And 802.11n brought us our first big changes for layer 2, and then also something called MIMO, or multi-in, multi-out. The later standards, 802.11ac, ad, are all combining these things to get the super mega ultra lightning, thank you for ozone speeds that were we're all hoping for. So there will be a time when really wired connections to things like desktops and stuff like that may be a thing of the past. Now wireless still has its problems even though it's super fast but really 802.11n brought in that new technology and that was really the first time that we could say that wireless speeds can compete with wired. Well, where does 802.11 live? I keep calling it a local area network standard, and so it is. It's, if, you, if you think in your brain, Ethernet, anytime you unplug Ethernet, you can just plug 802.11 right in there. So you may recall that we talked about the, uh, the Dix or the eight, IEEE 802.3 Ethernet. Those are our two flavors of Ethernet, and yes, I mentioned 802.3 because, again, IEEE standard. So, 802.11 has a layer 2 and has a layer 3. It has all of the stuff that we associate with a LAN standard. So it's got a logical link control, so framing and all of that, but then it's also got an access method. How do you decide whose turn it is to talk and for how long? And then of course we've got the physical layer, so that's kind of where it fits in the model. And so nodes that are on a wireless network still use IPv4 or IPv6, TCP and UDP, none of that changes. The only thing that's going on here is that we've completely supplanted what's going on at our layer 1 and layer 2 Ethernet with layer 1 and layer 2 802.11. Now the basic components that we'll come to know and love are our topologies, but also our individual components. So of course we've got ad hoc which folks talk a lot about in lectures about 802.11, but we don't actually use it very often, at least not in production networks. So the basic building block that we have in a wireless network is something called a basic service set or a BSS. And really that's the access point and whatever nodes are connected to it. When we want to grow things bigger, we need a distribution system, right? So we need the access points to be able to connect eventually back to the wired network and we call that an extended service set or an ESS. Now all the access points within the ESS have to have the same SSID or the network name. The network name or SSID is also called the service set identifier and so that is the text that you see when you're searching for or connecting to wireless networks. The access point, and we'll get a lot more into this in subsequent videos, but the access point's job is to control communication within what we call the cell. That is all the nodes connected to the access point and the connection to the distribution network or the wired network. And then your nodes can be anything, right? They can be cell phones, printers, game stations, desktops, USB connections, it doesn't really matter. Well, this has been a gentle intro to the 802.11 alphabet. In the coming weeks, I will cover as many aspects of 802.11 as I can fit in. So feel free to make suggestions along the way. I am planning on doing everything from antennas to network operation. We'll talk about home networks. We'll talk about the differences. You know, what's the big deal about being 2.4 gigahertz versus 5 gigahertz? Anything that I can think of. I am very excited. I think we'll have fun. So like and subscribe if you're also excited and hey, 
made those packets always reach their destinations and now we're doing wireless packets. Oh, and by the way, I'm gonna show you lots of wireless captures too.